Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing well, Bryce. How are you? Really good. I see uh, today uh, you have uh, you've moved branches. Yeah. So I've I got a little bit of a different background than what I normally get to see here when we when we record virtually. But uh, how's been how's the move been to White Mud Crossing? It has been really great. I am now working out of the White Mud Crossing location, and I'm getting to know the team here, the customers, everything. It's been a great day and a half so far. <laughs> That's great. Um, but yeah, there's seems like there's always so much change happening at EPL uh, in and around it. And one of the things that kind of we EPL recently introduced was a new role and it's uh epl now has a musician in residence we of course have a writer in residence but now we've got a musician in residence and uh, that musician is mallory chipman who's joining us today on the show mallory how are you today i'm really well thanks so much for having me yeah, of course. Uh, I know, unfortunately, one of these days we have to do like maybe a video podcast because I know you've got a couple of uh, four, four-legged four friends there with you kind of scurrying in and out of the background. And I promise today I'll do my best not to be distracted too much by them. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty cute. Um, this is definitely one of the perks uh, of working from home is the, the dogs all around us. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> but Bryce, if you see any four-legged creatures behind me, please do let me know because I am not expecting them. <laughs> no, that would be like we should probably stop recording then, and uh, and maybe call the call the fire department or police or something. So animal control. Uh, but yeah, I think we're gonna have a, a great show today. Uh, Mallory's here. We're gonna learn all about more about Mallory and her role here at EPL as musician in resonance. But uh, before we get started let's share some of our overdue finds picks uh mallory it's first time on the show uh this is where we kind of give some recommendations uh do you have anything that uh like a book or album or movie that you'd like to recommend yeah um two come to mind for me that i've been devouring lately um one is the new kurt vile record back to moon beach um, it's a really fun record that includes some new tunes, some revisions of his old work, which I really appreciate as a musician myself, the concept of like going back, digging into stuff, reinventing it. Um, and I also just finished reading The Woman and Me by Britney Spears yesterday. Oh. And wow, it was so amazing and kind of like inspiring and empowering um, to hear her tell her story in her own words after so long not being able to do that. So if there are any fans out there, people who've been interested kind of as her journey's gone on, I'd recommend it for sure. Interesting you bring that up. Uh, that book's actually been brought up on our last few episodes. Um, I think you're the first person we've talked to now that's actually read it. And um, I keep hearing, just like everybody else, little snippets about the book here and there on social media and online. And uh, like, not to say I will, I'm not a Britney Spears fan. I you know, definitely respect her as a musician, as an artist and everything. But, um, you know, it's something that even as kind of a very casual listener of hers that I'm very interested in, in reading. So I've heard nothing but great things about it. Mm -hmm. Caroline, have you read Britney Spears book yet? Not yet. I'm inching up my, the holds list and uh, I have seen it on the hits to go shelf. So if you're at a library branch, keep an eye out uh, there. You might get lucky lucky britney spears <laughs> with this song, um and and find it there but my pick this week is a documentary it's called buried the 1982 alpine meadows avalanche which is a very straightforward title it tells you exactly what it is and it's about the 1982 alpine meadows avalanche at a ski resort in lake tahoe california um it chronicles the uh, a little bit about how the the ski resort managed earthquake or um, avalanche and snowfall then it goes right into the avalanche itself which is actually I think three separate avalanches forming a mega avalanche and then the five-day search for eight missing people um, it 
the documentary like goes in and looks at the role of an avalanche forecaster, which I had never heard of before. Um, this the incident itself was one of the first times um, that search dogs were used in a, in the way that they were during it, and uh, just the limitations of technology and how it didn't always help or or it it, it got the rescuers to a point but then not far beyond that and then just looking at the people who worked on the ski patrol at the ski resort um the people on the scene the avalanche forecasters how they dealt with it and how they've been processing what ended up being spoiler alert one of the biggest uh most serious avalanches in u.s history so um it's a really gripping documentary uh it's very serious very solemn uh but quite respectful in how it tells the story of the people affected by this avalanche uh interesting you brought that up because i noticed that i think i i just found out about that documentary on the weekend i think it's on netflix as well it i want to say because that that's i think where i saw it and i i was like i'm gonna have to add that to my next up to watch list so um yeah it, i had never heard the story before um obviously it was quite young when that actually happened so um but yeah that, that's good to hear that it's uh, it's a gripping documentary it looks really good so um yeah i'll be i'll be checking that one out shortly yeah it makes kind of made me never want to go outside again but uh <laughs> uh yeah i i really enjoyed it so bryce what have you been enjoying lately well uh as a movie buff there's nothing i love more than learning about uh the making of a movie and especially ones where maybe you know it's like a cursed production or there's trouble behind the scenes i i'm all for that type of hollywood tea but um and recently we talked we talked about the exorcist on a on a recent episode of overdue finds and uh and i noticed in our collection that we have the first season of a documentary series called cursed films so naturally i had to borrow that and it's obviously my or my overdue finds pick this week so uh cursed films was originally released on the horror streaming service called shutter and uh It's a five-part series. It takes a look at some of the most infamous film productions, including The Exorcist, The Omen, Poltergeist, The Crow, and Twilight Zone, the movie. Uh, The series chats with uh, actors, directors, and crew members from all of these productions, and they address urban legends like, uh, did they use real skeletons in Poltergeist? And, of course, the alleged uh, Bruce Lee curse. Uh, So one of the toughest episodes is where they talk about twilight zone the movie and how uh, actor vic morrow and two young children died on set during a dangerous stunt involving a helicopter uh so if you're interested in kind of like behind the scenes details about some some movies or stuff maybe you've read online uh go check out uh, cursed films it's it's really good yeah, I was trying to guess which uh, movies uh, might be included before you mentioned them. I had Poltergeist, Twilight Zone, the movie that just is such a sad story. Uh, but uh, yeah, another in a documentary um, pick. For this Absolutely, week. and yeah, I actually just noticed on Shutter the other weekend, uh, season two of Cursed Films is uh, available. So let's get into today's topic. Mallory, before we ask you all about being EPL's uh, first uh, musician in residence, uh, you were just named to Edify Magazine's top 40 under 40 here in Edmonton. Uh, Congratulations. And uh, how did you find out that you were included on this list? Um, Yeah, well, thanks so much. It was a total surprise. Honestly, you're um anonymously nominated for this and so I'll never know who the very kind person was um who thought that I was sort of worthy of something like that it was so sweet um but yeah really really kind of wonderful honor and really special to be in such company I think the best part was actually like getting the physical copy and flipping through and reading everybody um else's sort of little short bio and thinking like someone thought I was <laughs> in this company. I mean, that's pretty amazing because there are some really incredible people who were listed in the class of 2023. So yeah, it's, it's really sweet. And whenever I look through that list every year, I'm just like, 
wow, like there's so many great people here in Edmonton doing such amazing, amazing work. And a lot of times it's from organizations that maybe you might not have heard of, but it's, uh, if you get a chance, uh, pick up a copy and look through it. It's, it's really uh, quite inspiring. Mm -hmm. We've had a few of the past writers in residence on the podcast, but what can you tell us about the musician in residence role? Well, um, it's a brand new role. It's a really unique position um, in the sense that it was introduced as a result of Edmonton being the Juno host city for 2023. So um, I didn't actually know this until this position came about, but every time a host city hosts the Junos, they're given sort of funding for a pilot project to happen after the Juno ceremony and sort of continue on the legacy of celebrating musical excellence in that city. And what um, the Juno host committee decided to do with it after, you know, a lot of thinking on it and discussion with the community was create a musician in residence position that would be publicly and freely accessible to all Edmontonians. Um, so this could be people who are professional musicians. This could be people who are budding musicians. This could be children, adults, whatever, right? And create sort of this freely accessible, you know, so, so-called expert in the field. And obviously I say that with the reality being I have much to learn, as we all do in this business, because it's one that is ever-changing and, and um, you know, it's a lifelong education, I, I truly believe. But Basically, what um, that has resulted in is a very multifaceted position, which includes open office hours where I um, hold office hours that are either bookable or can be dropped into at the Stanley Milner branch um, for people to come in and bring in any of their music related questions. So it could be anything from like, how do I write a grant or, hey, will you check out this song I wrote and I want some feedback? Um or we go into the studios that are in the makerspace uh, and do some demo recording. I even have two clients right now I'm working with who are, um, you know, recording what will be like professionally released singles um, that are being partially um, r- recorded here at the library and um, a result of a lot of the work we've done together. So that's really exciting. Um, and there's also been a couple of other facets in terms of workshops, um, workshops specifically with home recording songwriting, live jam sessions, things like that, to be working in larger groups and connecting community together. Um, Because obviously there are so much, or there is so much you can do as an individual in this business, but so much of it in reality is collaborative. And a lot of people just want to know where can I meet other like-minded folks? So it also facilitates a bit of that connection piece as well. That that, uh, community part is so important and especially here obviously at the library and it's something we've we've talked a lot about in the past is kind of having those uh connections with uh people in the in the community uh so i think what what kind of how you described it so far sounds you know really really rewarding actually so what's been like what's been uh, your favorite part about being in that role so far oh my goodness um it's so hard to choose i think the people I've met has been the most amazing part. Um, You know, you can feel like you know a lot of people in this community and you can feel like it's a fairly small community, but even then, you know, of course I'm in somewhat of a bubble, despite kind of having um, traversed a lot of genres and been connected to a lot of different communities throughout my career. Um, But I have been so inspired by meeting so many incredible creatives, like, people making really interesting music that is cutting edge or people working in interdisciplinary uh, art forms or people who are community builders and wanting to um, work in their own way facilitating connection and and um, interplay between artists and it's been extremely inspiring and rewarding to make connections with these people and offer them any insight that I can And definitely, like, it's a mutually rewarding process, I think, because as much as I might be able to offer them, I always leave feeling, like, ten times more inspired than I thought possible for that day. Um, So it's been really amazing just connecting with the people, most of all. Did you always want to be a musician? How did you get started in this world? Um, I think that in a roundabout way, I probably always did. I hadn't considered it seriously though for a long long time um I'd been playing music since I was a 
kid. I mean, you know, I was in kinder music when I was like one <laughs> and went on to play piano and cello, um, you know, when I was five, six kind of thing. And for many years, sang in choir, did all that sort of um, extracurricular music work. And only later in life, when I was about maybe in high school, did I kind of come to a crossroads of like, okay, what do I actually want to do when I get out of here? And and how can I make it something that I don't need math 30 to graduate for? Um, and at that point, I was like, oh, fine arts <laughs> might be the way to go then. Um, and I really had always been doing music, and I kind of always knew it would be a part of my life. Um, I just wasn't sure that it would be the part of my life that was, you know, not only my greatest passion, but also my career. And, and that can be something that's not for everybody. Um, and for some people... I think very fairly so, it can take some of this sort of joy away from it, or it can uh, make the boundaries a little bit too unclear, and I totally appreciate that, but I thought, you know, I'm going to give this a shot, and uh, at that point, dove in head first and realized, like, oh my goodness, this is so much more multifaceted just than songwriting in my bedroom or performing. Um, there's, you know, production, there's co-writing, there's arranging for ensembles, there's really playing with... Um, you know, a band that's bigger than just the three folks I was playing in a literal garage with at that time. Um, and not that they weren't awesome, but I just mean, you know, there were so many different ways to collaborate and, and to imagine collaborating. So at that point, um, the door was kind of open for me. And I thought, wow, like this is something that'll never get old. This is something that'll constantly be, like I said earlier, just transforming as it does and as any art form does and anything somewhat rooted in technology does. Um, and it will be something that kind of in, as a result continues to stay interesting and inspiring. So at that point I thought I'll, you know, I wanted to learn more about theory and arranging and things like that. Um, so I did my undergrad in music and worked for years after that, just in that field. And, and then over the pandemic went back to school and did my master's to kill time when there were no gigs around. <laughs> um, <laughs> And in music as well, and, and dove into some other kind of angles in that degree and, and uncovered a little more about songwriting and something called zoomusicology, which is um, the study of animal sounds as music. Um, and really just sort of, again, like I'm talking all angles here, tried to diversify how I connect with this art form. And, and it, like I suspected, you know, it's never been a dull moment since. Um, like you, I same thing when... Uh... I was kind of getting to the end of high school. I was like, okay, can I get out of here without passing math 30? That would be, that would be fantastic. So I'm glad I'm not the only one here. <laughs> you are not the only one. Yeah. Math and sciences for me, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, obviously big music fan when you were growing up. Uh, what's like, what were some of your influences and uh, what type of music did you enjoy listening to? I think this is actually probably also a reason that I, uh, have been drawn to music from so many different angles. Is I was always exposed to a really eclectic mix, and I didn't realize that at the time until, you know, trying to connect with friends of my own age at school, and they're like, you know, have you heard the new Spice Girls record? And I'm like, what? Who's that? <laughs> and I've been listening to, like, Pat Metheny Group um, and Van Halen. <laughs> so it's like... You know, it, it, it was always something that was really eclectic. I, I think I, I always listened to um, a mix of music my parents were listening to. Uh, you know, like my parents were really just big into music. So we always had the radio on and, and CDs and tapes um, of a lot of new stuff that was out and around that time. Like a lot of 90s mom rock, you know, Sarah McLaughlin and Alanis Morissette and and um, bands like The Violent Femmes and Talking Heads and and um, also, yeah, just old rock bands, you know, The Stones and, and The Scorpions and everyone in between. Um, and then also listen to a lot of instrumental stuff, a lot of jazz, a lot of improvised music, um, and a lot of classical stuff as well. Movie scores, um, folk artists like, you know, Joni Mitchell, Tracy Chapman. Um, just like a, a real gamut. I would say my biggest gap was and kind of continues to be like currently what is on the radio um i always feel like i'm catching up to it about five years later and i'm like oh now i had time to finally check that out um so now you know i know a lot more tunes that were on the radio then <laughs> than i did at the time but 
um, and have a lot of appreciation for all of it. I think it's kept me really kind of open to just about everything. Well, you fit in great with Caroline and I, because we, <laughs> same thing for us. We joke about this all the time on the show, you know, new music. We're like, what? Like, yeah, we'll hear about it after it's kind of gone through its wave of popularity and is maybe on its way out. But uh, ask us about anything eighties, nineties. We, we got you covered. <laughs> Uh, you've performed and written music across a wide range of genres, including rock, hip hop, folk, punk, and jazz. Do you have a favorite genre that you like to work in? No, I find that they all sort of bring out a different part of me um, and scratch a different sort of creative itch. Uh, I think that regardless of what I'm working on, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to express my own musical voice. And so, you know, for example, when I've recorded um, something like hip hop or jazz on other folks' records as a featured artist, for example, um, and they've given me the freedom to, you know, do what you want with this, um, it's been really nice because no matter of what style the music is, I've still been able to kind of musically express um, kind of my own creative vision and maintain the integrity of that and then of course the the records that I've created myself um which thus far have kind of been in the either jazz or kind of experimental rock slash also folk singer songwriter still quite a smorgasbord there um but again you know, like kind of driving my own bus obviously I've had that freedom maintained but um yeah I've been really fortunate when recording as a side person too, to just be working with people who really value that and, and just want me to show up with my own artistic vision because that's why they hired me, you know? So regardless of the style, I feel like genre plays less of a role there for me in terms of um, the importance. Like I, I don't really consider myself a purist in that way. Um, just like music is more about the spirit or the essence of the thing. And how can I filter my voice through that in a way that works with the other artists or musicians on the track? Yeah, I was wondering if you, you've faced that pressure, had that pressure to be a, like one thing, especially with the, the music, the albums you've done on, on your own. Um, but it's great to hear you describe yourself with so many genres and words on that, that you've really been able to stay true to yourself and your music. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's been something I have felt pressure on, honestly, and I've waffled um, on, like, is this ridiculous and confusing to my audience? And, you know, so many things when you, <laughs> and, you know, as an artist, you're, you're everything. You're your own marketing person, right? So I'll attend webinars on, like, how to market your music, blah, 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 blah. And I'm hearing stuff like, oh, be one thing, you know, stick to a brand, and for a long time, that made me really doubt what I was doing. Um, but I had a great meeting with um, a local music administrator and musician, Jess Marsh, um, from Jam Management and Neon Moon Records. And she really said something that stuck with me that was just like, your brand is your story. And your story is that you are someone who traverses these things. And you are someone who sort of does weave in and out of different genres and that's what makes you you as an artist that's the story you need to be telling and when she framed it to me like that it was like everything snapped into place um yeah I'm not going to be the artist that does one thing and that might actually impact the success of my career commercially and that's okay I think I'd rather that than try to put myself in a box um that doesn't really reflect who I am um, because, you know, as we went through some of my listening history, it's like, this all makes sense <laughs> to me now, you know? It's like, I've always been kind of a, a person who appreciates all ends of the spectrum. And here we are, right? Making music kind of in, in uh, all of those angles. And, and a lot of acts do that, you know, historically. Um, look at Taylor Swift, like the biggest artist in the world, and her records have really run the gamut. Maybe not quite as drastically, um, but really, I mean... She was a country artist quite traditionally on her first two records and and now is really making pop tunes and and it didn't confuse anybody. Or like, you know, more more stereotypically, the Beatles um are known for transforming between every record and and I think there's a real beauty in that because it reminds us we don't have to 
stay the same forever in our work, which is really freeing because we sure as hell aren't staying the same forever as individual people, you know? So let the work evolve as we do. And I think that's the most organic way to kind of go about that process. One group I always point to is Queen. And you can have five different favorite Queen songs that sound nothing like each other in terms of sound or genre on that. Absolutely. That's a great example. Yeah, it's interesting to listen to like a best of Queen album and it's just like, whoa, like it is all over the place. And yeah, that's what makes it cool. And it's, it's, you know, that's who they, that's who they are. And uh, especially, you know, for you, Mallory, as well, I imagine that kind of helps you get more fans too, actually, is, you know, you're releasing music that's um, true to you and who, who you are too, and probably helps you uh, connect with uh, more people that way. I think so. And I've had some really good feedback from folks who like wouldn't have checked out maybe the folkier stuff or the jazzier stuff who then, because they were listening on a streaming service that just connected them to one of my next tunes, were like, oh, I was really surprised that I really enjoyed that jazz arrangement or this or that. And it's always nice to hear that like, okay, hey, maybe this is opening up people's ears too. I mean, that's a bonus. So you mentioned that uh, you have released some albums. You've actually released five, uh, a couple that are actually in our collection that you can borrow here at uh, EPL include uh, Rags and Feathers and uh, Nocturnalize. So I've always been curious about this as far as um, like when somebody releases an album, um, like how long does that normally take? Like you, if you have an idea where, you know, I'm going to put this album together, um, how long does that process take? And what does, what does that whole thing look like? Um, I think it's different for every artist. Uh, depends kind of how involved you are in the process of production and also how many hands you have kind of behind the music on your team. I'm helping things move along. (laughs) What I generally say is way longer than you think it's going to, (laughs) because every record I put out, I'm like, why didn't I give myself six more months Um, or whatever it might be. But I think generally like a year um, sort of from recording or like kind of conception to release in terms of really working on the record. But the truth is, you know, the writing of those tunes might have started 10 years before. Right. And so, you know, I think in some small way, there was like this project marinating probably for a lot longer than that. Um, But I would say like by the time that everything is recorded and mixed and mastered and then all the singles have kind of had their gradual release. And then by the time that things put out, that's sort of like the minimum timeline generally you're looking at. I recorded a record, not this most recent April, but the one before that, um, that still isn't out yet. And I'll be putting it out in 2024. So that's just like an example of it taking longer, you know, and that was a a choice to just sit on that because I wanted to space it out from another recent release. So in some ways, too, it just depends on kind of your timeline and what you as an artist are able to schedule into the various things between tours and, and recording and songwriting and all the different sort of seasons of our work. Now, I, I work in marketing, so I've always been curious to know, though, is coming up with the album cover one of the most challenging things? <laughs> or is that like, obviously making the music is the most challenging part, but uh, how, how difficult is it coming up with uh, album covers? Um, wow, I think that it, it depends probably on the artist. I definitely am somebody who probably is not nearly as invested in marketing as I should be. (laughs) Um, I'm really enchanted by the music part and I kind of am like, oh, everything else takes me away from that, Um, which I know is a a totally silly attitude to have, but there's just so much on the go always. And, And sometimes album art is something that I'm happy to just sort of explain to Uh, an artist that I know and trust. Here's sort of like a general vibe I'm going for. What do you think? And at that point, if they present something amazing, which 99% of the time they do, I'm like, yay, you've made my job so easy. (laughs) And it's also amazing. And I also like in the same, you know, way I was speaking about collaborating with other artists, I want to give artists freedom to do their thing. I wouldn't be asking them, um, if I didn't seek out their portfolio and enjoy their work, you know, and think they were a good fit. So in that sense, generally, I usually allow quite a bit of freedom there. Um, 
I think the most effort is actually finding artists that I, you know, just generally think that my vision aligns with theirs, which is sort of like pre me actually contacting them. But I definitely know of artists who are extremely particular and I really respect that. Like that is some extreme devotion to like the entire package um, who I'm sure really labor over that. I just can't say one of them. You mentioned earlier that you've been working with some of the Edmontonians who are looking for advice on their music through the Musician in Residence program. What kind of advice do you give to people who are looking to put a song together or are trying to get their music out there? Um, it really depends on the project in terms of specific um, pieces of feedback. But generally speaking, I would say that the most important thing is to not compromise the integrity of the project for um, overall popular commercial co uh, consumption. And I think it's really tempting to think you have to water something down or think you should make something more palatable or whatever um, in order for it to be more commercially viable. And I think there's a difference between like if you have a, you know, 45 second intro that isn't really necessarily doing something and you said, oh, yeah, I just had that on the demo, but I'm not married to it. If you decide to cut that for the sake of, you know, more likely radio play, that's great. That's not compromising the integrity of your project. Maybe that will help you get a little bit more, you know, uh, awareness around this tune because it will make it more likely to be played on the radio. But in terms of like, what are the essentials here? What is what is the real sort of bones um, of this project that to you are the song that are inextricable from the essence of the piece that stuff can't go anywhere and I think that so often from artists I'll hear um, you know I, I put out this last tune or I recorded this EP and I didn't like it I hear that all the time you know I wasn't happy with how it went or I felt pressured to take it in another direction whether from a producer, from listening to other tracks and comparing it or, or whatever, just kind of not sticking to their own artistic compass. And I think especially when you're an emerging artist, people doubt their artistic compass. They wonder if they even have one. And the truth is, of course they have one. I mean, that's why they're here. That's why they're making art. That's why they're even bettering themselves and taking on professional development by asking people for insight, you know, they're clearly devoted to this and they have sort of a pulse that's going to guide them in this right direction. And, and I really think that, and I, I know that this is sort of a cliche, I know I'm not the only one who thinks this, but you liking it is more important than anyone else liking it. Bottom line, right? And I think that I've been lately pointing everyone towards that new Rick Rubin book, um, the creative act just because he really hammers that and it's like I can say it and no one will listen necessarily very fair um, but he saying it like this is a guy who has you know myriad experience beyond most folks and like I think it's really really extra heavy coming from him so yeah I mean I think that's the ultimate thing and the other thing is work with people that you trust um I had some advice early on in my career that don't worry about working with the best people. Work with the people who are most devoted to the project and the people who you can trust. Um, because, and obviously, like, if they're great, that's extra awesome. <laughs> but I think the other thing is a lot of people, especially emerging artists, especially, you know, artists who fall into various minority groups, like, historically have been taken advantage of in this industry. And um, I know, you know, a lot of women and non-binary folks in music who are on the artist side wind up working with producers or engineers who are male just by nature of like the stats in the industry. More people who work in music tech are male right now. And I, I think that that's going to change and is changing. But um, generally, there's this sort of like a power dynamic that can sometimes be upheld just by nature of sort of, um, you know, systemic um, issues with uh, gender imbalance and, and power and how those things correlate. And I think in the studio so often, you know, I've, I've heard from young women like 
well, the producer thinks I should do this, and he really thinks I should, and he has all this experience, so I think I'm just going to do it. And what I'm realizing there is, A, they're not sticking necessarily, like I said, to that artistic compass, but B, also, do they have a relationship with this person where they could actually say, you know, I actually want to go ahead with my idea. Is that mutual respect there? Is there transparency? Is there trust? Is there support from both sides? And and if not, like, I think that it's okay to walk away. Um, and I think that following your gut about those things is really important because these are collaborations. These aren't just people you're hiring to, you know, write a new bio for you. These are people you're hiring to bring your music to an audience and to kind of fill that essential role of, of transforming it from something that was played in your, you know, bedroom or a small venue or whatever, and now into, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of listeners. And I think it's really crucial that we're working with people who we um, have good, trustworthy and mutually respectable kind of relationships with. We're coming to the end of today's episode. Bryce, before we get to the roundtable questions, can you let everyone know uh, what we'll be chatting about on the next episode, which will be available on Friday, December 15th? So every year we like to release a special Christmas themed episode of Overdue Finds. And on our next episode, we're going to be chatting all about the Christmas classic, Die Hard. So this year marks the film's 35th anniversary, and uh, we're going to be uh, chatting all about the film's history, including how Frank Sinatra was almost John McClane, the awesomeness of Bruce Willis and Alan Rickman, and of course we settle any debate about whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not. So join us for our 150th episode, where we'll get together and have a few laughs. Uh, Mallory, are you a fan of uh, Die Hard? I was actually, as you were saying this, I'm like, I'm so ashamed. I've never seen it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's reaction is sort of like that sigh of disappointment. I was no, n- not not mine. I saw it for the first <laughs> time within the last five years, probably. So okay, solidarity. Yeah. All right. So, quick roundtable question time. Okay, you're, let's say you're only allowed to listen to three albums for the rest of your life. Mallory, I'm going to start with you. Which three albums would those be? I think Buena Vista Social Club by Buena Vista Social Club. Um, Hajira by Joni Mitchell. And Sgt. Pepper's probably. Nice. Caroline, how about you? I was very close to Sgt. Pepper, but I'm going with Abbey Road uh, by the Beatles. Um, I'm going with the, a specific compilation, The Very Best of Tchaikovsky, uh, because it has a really good um, cross cut of the different ballets and classical pieces and some of my favorite ones. And then the 1996 Grammy nominees uh, compilation album like it i think you brought up that album a few times I, it, on the show yeah ab- i absolutely have <laughs> any opportunity i am there i mean it's got seal it's got alanis it's got boys to men like what else do you need yeah love it all right so for me uh like you mallory i also kind of grew up listening to a wide range of music so My three picks are all vastly different. So first of all, I'm going to go with Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. Um, Alive, the first Alive album by Kiss. And my third pick is uh, Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys. So a little little bit of everything there. I think you were just at the Kiss concert. I was, yeah. uh, It was awesome. I loved it. It was my second time seeing them and... uh, a lot of people will say what they will about their music, but they put on an awesome live show. So uh, they were fun. All right. So last question. Mallory, I know uh, you've written music for musical theater productions. So I have to ask, what's everyone's favorite all-time, all-time favorite stage musical? Oh, man. That is so hard, but um, I'm going to have to say Rent. I like it. Caroline? Yes, Rent, um, <laughs> but 
but also like yes they were and ta- yeah yes <laughs> and I agree and I also say um Chicago which was the first um show where I listened to the music first and really fell in love mm. with the soundtrack the score the 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 songs of it um before seeing how it it interplayed and then my most recent I loved six the musical six but uh, oh, that was so good yeah, so there, there's there's a couple choices for you, <laughs> just Fair in one. case you needed one, Bryce. Uh, yeah, I do have one. <laughs> uh, now I have to ask though, rent, Caroline. Was it on a very early episode of the podcast? You're like, just pay your rent. Yeah, you, you got it. <laughs> like, there's a difference between watching it at a younger age and then an old, where you're like. You, you kind of have to pay rent, but, you know, the system is messed up. That's hilarious, because I remember watching that movie with a friend who'd never seen it, and he was so perplexed, like, but if they just paid their rent, this wouldn't be happening. I'm like, but then we wouldn't have this great musical, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the villain of the, the piece is just like, you know, oh, I'm going to give you this free space for you to work, and... Yeah. Anyway, this whole thing, <laughs> Bryce. What is your your favorite? All right. So I've talked about this on the show. I'm not unfortunately. I'm not the biggest musical fan. I do appreciate them and I love how people uh, really are huge fans of them. But all it took for me was for the creators of South Park to put together a musical, and I was sold. So of course, my pick is uh, the Book of Mormon saw a few years ago here at the jube when they were touring across canada and uh yeah as a south park fan i, lo- I loved it it was it was great bring together some crude humor and some catchy songs and uh that's all it took for me to become a fan well and i think you know the the multiple examples that that we have here uh, again point to musicals can be a lot of different things on stage so mm-hmm. yeah Thank you so much for joining us today, Mallory. This has been fantastic to talk to you. Where can people go to find out more about your work here at EPL and what is coming up for you? Thank you so much for having me. Um, On the EPL website, there is a Musician in Residence page. And if you click on that or the um, upcoming music events, you can see all of the different sort of things ranging from the office hours to the songwriter circles, the jam sessions, all of that good stuff. Um, and generally, I am online at MalloryChipmanMusic.com, um, on Instagram at ParanorMallory, and Facebook at Mallory Chipman Music. Yeah, that's where you can find me. Great. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't done so, we encourage you to subscribe so that you get all of our new episodes. Please also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Maybe tell us what your favorite uh, musical is. Uh, and most importantly, tell a friend about the show. Yeah, and don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. And of course, as Caroline mentioned, we'd love to hear from our listeners. You can reach Caroline and myself by emailing us at podcast at EPL dot CA or hit us up on, t- on Twitter or X as the cool kids call it uh, by using the hashtag EPL overdue finds. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.